Hello and welcome to the second day of the ECB Forum on Central Banking, this year dedicated to the role and policies of central banks in a shifting world. Yesterday, we heard the introductory speech from ECB President Christine Lagarde. We discussed implications of global changes for central banks and had a panel discussion on inflation objectives, structural forces and communication. In case you missed it, all of yesterday's content is available on our website. Today, we will start by discussing macroeconomic stabilization frameworks in the new economic environment, before turning to monetary policy instruments and financial stability. And we will conclude the forum with the policy panel. Let me remind you that all sessions and panels during the forum are on the record and are webcast live. We encourage you all to join our social media conversation using the hashtag ECBforum. Our participants will be able to interact live with our speakers. For that, you can raise your virtual hand already ahead of the Q&A time in each session. I would request again today that participants keep their questions to 90 seconds, as we have a full programme and time will be limited. But now, let me welcome Fabio Panetta, member of the Executive Board of the ECB, who will chair the first session today. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Terry. Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to this second session on macroeconomic stabilization frameworks. This session brings together two topics that are widely debated in the current environment of low inflation and low interest rates. The first topic is the interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy, which according to many has become more important for macroeconomic outcomes. The second topic refers to the monetary policy challenges that are associated with the decline in the natural rate of interest. At the root of both issues, the monetary fiscal interaction and the new challenges for monetary policy, lies the fact that central banks are more likely to hit the lower bound of nominal rates than in the past. As a consequence, non-conventional monetary policy measures have become more important for avoiding a low inflation equilibrium. And fiscal policy in this phase has become an important channel for transmitting those measures as the fiscal multiplier increases at the effective lower bound. Before giving the floor to our speakers, I wish to make one observation. The challenges related to the low interest rate environment are important not only in the short term for the conjuncture, but also from a longer term perspective for two reasons. The first reason is that the factors that are associated to the fall of the natural rate of interest, such as uh, productivity growth, uh, aging population or scarcity of safe assets, are slow moving, hardwired and persistent. Therefore, reversing their impact on interest rates appears to me to be challenging, at least in the short to medium term. Second, if we look at long historical time series of interest rates, we would soon realize that low interest rates are not that unusual. On the contrary, what seems to be unusual is the high level of interest rates of the 1970s and the 1980s. This may imply that if and when central banks will be able to normalize their instrument set again, they will still have to confront a high risk of hitting the lower bound. In fact, policy normalization may not mean returning to higher rates, but rather dealing with the reality of a world with low R star. This is the focus of this session, in which we have two outstanding economists. Professor Klaus Adam from the University of Mannheim will have 20 minutes to present his paper entitled Monetary Policy Challenges from Falling Natural Interest Rates. We will then have a 10-minute discussion by Arjas Bordone from the New York Fed. I will then open the floor for questions, which will be allocated 90 seconds each. To ask for the floor, you should raise your electronic hand. With this, Klaus, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Fabio. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak at this event on monetary policy challenges from falling natural interest rates. Um, 
Let me see, this is not working now. Here we go. So central banks um, in advanced economies have been um, confronted with a number of um, adverse macroeconomic trends, amongst which were um, generally declining trend growth rate over the past decades, and um, perhaps triggered by that, uh, corresponding decline in the natural rate of interest, which is the real interest rate consistent with stable inflation. Of course, these concepts being theoretical concepts, it's at any point in time, somewhat uncertain what the level of the trend growth rate is of the economy and also what the natural rate of the economy is. But there is a wide agreement amongst economic observers that there are downward trends in both of these over time. And um, this downward pressure has obviously put some downward pressure on nominal interest rates over time to the extent that many central banks are now pushed for extended periods of time to what is called the effective lower bound for nominal rates. That is a situation where policy rates are either close to zero or slightly below zero. So for the European Central Bank, this has been the case uh, since uh, July 2012 when the main refinancing operation rate uh, has uh, reached zero. Federal Reserve had seven years of zero interest rates up to 2015, and then again following uh, the pandemic at the start of this year. Japan has had um, the earliest uh, you know, decline in the natural rate and also has seen the lower bound uh, virtually without interruption being reached ever since 1999. So this is the situation where we are. Uh, we find ourselves increasingly at the lower bound. Um, I think it's important um, to recognize that the effective lower bound is in fact a real constraint for monetary policy. And um, there are two pieces of evidence um, that we can put forward to show this. So the first, if you look at central banks that have reached their effective lower bound, these are the central banks that have persistently undershot their inflation targets. And um, they have done so despite um, the ample deployment of a large variety and, um, you know, and uh, in big terms of quantitative easing measures. And in some times they have done this even despite the joint deployment of uh, quantitative easing measures and fiscal policy measures. And, and the euro area is no exception to this. If you look at the HICP inflation average, since the point where the main refinancing operation rate has uh, reached zero in July 2012, the average inflation rate since then has been 0.8%, which clearly is below 2%, but not anywhere near, uh, is close to 2%. The second piece of evidence that sort of uh, speaks to the effective lower bound being um, uh, a real constraint is if you look at um, what these measures do, the quantitative easing measures actually do. While we have sort of reasonable good estimates of how they affect financial market prices like long-term bond yields, risk premium, default premium of various kinds, there is um, quite a considerable degree of uncertainty how these measures affect macroeconomic outcomes, in particularly inflation. And this is also something that Volker Wieland has addressed yesterday. So there's reason to believe given this uncertainty that we are not entirely sure to what extent these measures actually are suitable uh, and effective in substituting fully for nominal interest rate movements. Now, I'm afraid to say that these two trends that I've just mentioned are not the only adverse trends uh, that have you know, come up over the recent decades. Uh, besides declining long-term growth rates and uh, declining national rates of interest, there's evidence uh, that asset price volatility has also risen over the same you know, period. In particular, we have seen a number of large and very persistent housing price cycles in many of these economies, in advanced economies. And we have seen what is a near back-to-back -back repeat cycles in equity markets. So these are, of course, challenging for monetary policy because these asset price cycles have all kinds of real implications and uh, it may generate also sorts of credit market distortions of various kinds. And perhaps triggered by that, um, there is additional evidence that um, as the average level of the natural rate has come down, its volatility has increased at the same time, which is, of course, particularly bad news if you're confronted with a lower bound constraint on nominal interest rates. 
Now let's have a look at um, the evidence on asset price volatility. Of course, it's generally hard to pin down the volatility of asset prices for two reasons. The volatility is large and therefore uncertainty about its precise level is large and asset price swings are very persistent so that over time one doesn't get a lot of independent observation. And it's even harder you know, to measure changes in asset price volatility over time. So the only thing one can really do to deal with these issues is to compare long time spans and uh, to see whether over those time spans there's a trend. And this is exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look at asset price volatility over the past 30 years and then compare it to the prior 30 years to spot some trends. Um, let's have a look at housing markets first. So this is a graph that is showing you the standard deviation, so the measure of volatility of a basic housing market valuation ratio, the price to rent ratio. So the blue bars are the, price to, the standard deviation of the price to rent ratio prior to 1990, and the red bars are the standard deviation of the price to rent ratio post-1990. And the, the set of countries is Canada, France, Germany, Japan, UK, USA. So you see that the point estimates have increased in all those economies and in some of them quite substantially. But because of the high uncertainty associated with these point, point estimates, not all of these increases are statistically significant at all times, but some of them are, as you can see by the p-values shown at the bottom of the table. Now, if we compare you know, the joint evolution of average natural rates pre and post 1990 and the standard deviation of uh, the changes in the standard deviation of the price rent ratio, we get at this scatter plot. On the x-axis, you have the change in the average natural rate in these economies pre and post 1990. And on the y-axis, you have the change in the standard deviation of the price rent ratio in housing markets. And you can see that all these economies fall in the upper left quadrant. They experience quite substantial changes in natural rates and an increase in the price rent ratio volatility over this time period. If we then look at, at the same picture for equity markets, we see something very similar, also not as stark as in uh, housing markets. So again, uh, we have the change in the average natural rate pre and post 1990 on the x-axis, and now the change in the standard deviation of the price dividend ratio, a basic valuation measure for equity market prices on um, the y-axis. And you can see most of the economies with the exception of France and Japan fall into the upper part. Japan obviously being an outlier because the sample split here occurs around the peak of the late 1980s Japanese uh, stock market boom and so that the run-up is in the first phase and the, 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 the decline of asset prices in the second sample period. But overall, the message I would say is very similar to that of housing markets. So now um, what to make out of this observation that asset price volatility seems to have increased? Well, one very natural reaction by economists would be to say, well, it could all be quite efficient because in the world, in which real rates and natural rates are lower on average, it is efficient that asset market volatility increases because any persistent move in fundamental now gets discounted less and therefore should have a higher effect on current market prices. So this is all fine, but um, I would caution to this because there is mounting evidence that asset price volatility cannot be entirely efficient. In particular, if you look at investor surveys that ask investors about their capital gain and return expectations in markets, there is very clear evidence of the presence of investor optimism and pessimism, and in particular of quite significant deviations from the assumption that these uh, investor expectations are consistent with rational forecasts. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, the patterns of optimism and pessimism of a form that they actually amplify asset price volatility. So to give you an example, um, let's have a look at uh, the expected and the actual capital gains uh, in housing markets, okay? So we can run two very simple regressions that will give you a flavor of the kind of results that are around. So the first regression is um, 
regressing on the left hand side, investors expectations about the capital gains to be made in housing markets on a constant A, a coefficient C, and then a basic valuation measure of how richly the market is valued here at the price rent ratio in the market. So this tells you, you know, the coefficient C is going to tell you how investors expectations co-move with how richly the market is valued. The second equation is very similar, but puts on the left hand side, the realized capital gains as they mature uh, down the road and regresses those on uh, the valuation measure, the price rent ratio. And the very typical finding uh, in, is that we can make is that in actual investor expectations of uh, investor expectations are pro-cyclical. So the coefficient C is positive, which means that investors are optimistic about future capital gains when current market valuation is high. Realized capital gains, however, tend to be counter-cyclical. So, you know, somewhat puzzlingly, puzzlingly, the realized capital gains tend to be particularly low when the market is valued richly. To give you an example of this kind of result, uh, I've run um, this regression on the Michigan Household Survey over the period 2007-20, where we regress expected capital gains and actual capital gains on the price-rent ratio. And you see the positive coefficient on the expected capital gains. You see the negative coefficient on the realized capital gains. And a, a test that takes into account that asks, are these coefficients actually equal as they should be if forecasts were rational, uh, is, is strongly you know, rejecting the notion of rationality. And of course, the fact that expectations are high when market valuation is high strongly suggests that the reason market valuation is high is because potentially investors are too optimistic about the future returns in these markets. Now, it's important to note that this phenomenon is not confined to housing markets. We have shown and documented the same pattern in stock markets uh, with general stock market investors. And there are, of course, additional dimensions along which expectations display biases that I have no time getting into. But if you ask me about, you know, overall looking at all those surveys over time, how would, what's the simplest way to explain the expectations, the capital gain expectations in, of housing investors and stock market investors, retail stock market investors? Well, it, this evidence is all consistent with these expectations, these investors weekly extrapolating past capital gains into the future. It gives rise to the sort of expectational patterns that I've just documented. Now, this is um, worrying, but it is even more worrying in a world where interest rates and real interest rates are low. And the reason is that the sensitivity of asset prices to any given amount of investor optimism and pessimism that is not justified by subsequent outcomes on average is higher when the real interest rates are low. So asset prices respond more to this optimism and press pessimism when the natural rate and the real interest rate is low on average. And if investors then extrapolate from past asset price movements into the future, this is going to increase the likelihood of belief-driven boom and bust cycles. And this is one way to explain how asset price volatility has increased at the same time as natural rates of interest have come down. Now, what of course, the question is, what are the monetary policy implications of this um, asset price movements that are potentially inefficient? And uh, in particular, if these inefficiencies increase in size as the natural interest rates fall. Well, we know that inefficient volatility in asset prices can generate all kinds of distortions. For instance, it can have uh, direct effects on resource allocation. You get a housing price boom that is driven by housing price optimism. You get overinvestment in housing, as we may have seen in some of the economies in the past. You get credit misallocation. You get effects on balance sheets and all kinds of effects. What we have shown is that these effects have the potential to increase the volatility of the natural rate. So this is also an avenue not only to explain higher volatility of the asset prices, but also to explain why simultaneously low levels of the natural rate have been associated with a higher volatility. 
And that is, of course, very bad news because now the effective lower bound becomes more stringent because of two reasons, because its average level is falling and because the volatility around that average level is increasing. If we look at the empirical evidence on the volatility of um, the natural rate, there is some evidence that suggests that volatility of natural rates have in fact increased at the same time as the average level has fallen. So here you see again a scatter plot where I plot the change in the average natural rate on the x-axis and the change in the standard deviation of the natural rate on the y-axis. And you see that most of the economies again fall in the upper left quadrant uh, which suggests that volatility of the asset price of the natural rate has in fact gone up as the natural rate fell on average. So then what are the monetary policy implications uh, that come along with a more stringent effective lower bound? Well, I think our model suggests uh, it would be optimal to regain some room for conventional monetary interest per policy by increasing the inflation target or the average inflation rate implemented by monetary policy. Of course, the increase in inflation target doesn't come without cost. Higher inflation is gonna have welfare costs, but these welfare costs are gonna have to be traded off against the increased ability to stabilize the economy when the inflation target is somewhat higher. Now, the quantitative resolution of you know, these two uh, effects, the higher welfare costs of inflation and the increased ability to stabilize, depends in important ways on how one interprets the observed increase in asset price volatility. In particular, if one thinks the asset price increase, the increased asset price volatility is efficient, then it is you know, the welfare cost of inflation that is the dominant concern. If you think that the increase in asset price volatility is not entirely efficient, then um, the increased ability and desire to stabilize more takes more of an effect. So let's illustrate this. Let's first have a look at the world where the increase in asset price volatility is entirely efficient. And this graph shows you the optimal increase in the target due to the presence of a lower bound uh, on the y-axis as a function of the average level of the natural rate. So for level, average levels of the natural rate around two to 3%, you know, the lower bound doesn't do a lot. And um, you know, um, there's not a, a great desire to increase uh, the inflation target because of the presence of the lower bound, because you're far away from it. But as the average natural rate falls, you see some effect, but the overall effect is relatively muted. It's around 0.4 percentage points. So this was the case where asset price volatility was efficient and therefore the only fact that is present as the natural rate falls is that you get closer to the bound, but there is no effect coming from the volatility of the natural rate increasing at the same time. So what happens to this picture if you sort of think that at least partly asset price movements are not entirely due to fundamentals? Well, this curve shifts up quite considerably and also becomes steeper. It becomes more responsive to the average natural rate. So now as the average natural rate falls from a level of say 3% to a level of one eighth of a percent, the inflation target increases by a full percentage point. So this shows you how you know, the optimal increase in the target depends to a large extent how you interpret the increased asset price volatility. Now, of course, and this is something that has been raised in the, in the discussion yesterday, the undershooting of the current target is a problem. Is it sensible to raise the target in a setting where you currently undershoot? And I think there are two views to this. There's the somewhat optimistic view that by purely raising the target alone, inflation expectations will follow suit and will do largely the job. But uh, there is a pessimistic view, which is probably you know, uh, of some relevance, that by rising, raising the target, the only thing you effectively do is increase the distance between the target and the actual inflation rate, so the target shortfall. And it was also uh, mentioned yesterday that this uh, will have potentially a reputational damage. 
So how, if one is concerned, uh, is convinced that some increase in the target were warranted, could one get from here to there? Now, the alternative approaches to deal uh, with these pessimistic concerns. One of it has been mentioned yesterday by Jory Gali. He said that we should act opportunistically. So once we have increased the target, we have reached the current target, uh, we can sort of think about it and increase the target to where we think it should be. But I think this has costs and it has uh, opens uh, the central bank to some criticisms down the road that it's raising the target at the time it's potentially overshooting its previous target. So there could be some value of pre-announcing that the target will be revisited once the existing target is reached. And the reason being that maybe you will look less opportunistically and also you're gonna potentially at least get some of the expectation and anticipation effects without suffering the reputational damage of increasing the distance to your current target. I have no um, time to talk about um, this. I think I'm largely out of time. So let me wrap up. Um, so central banks confronted with lower average levels of the natural rate and um, higher volatility of asset prices and also higher volatility of the natural rate uh, should uh, certainly rethink their inflation targets. The welfare costs of higher targets should be traded off against the increased gains to stabilize in the presence of an effective lower bound constraint. And quantitatively, these trade-offs are going to depend, amongst other things, on how one is going to interpret increased asset price volatility. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, we now have the discussion by Arja Sbordone. Arja, you have the floor. Seems to be some problem in the connection. Maybe I can take this few seconds to encourage you to raise your virtual hand to ask questions to Klaus while we are waiting to be connected with Arja. Hello. Arja, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabio, and thanks for inviting me uh, to participate in this distinguished forum uh, and giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, Klaus' paper. Uh, the, uh, whatever I say is my own opinion and don't reflect um, uh, the opinion of the Federal Reserve of the Bank of New York. Um, so the uh, paper addresses, as uh, Klaus said, uh, dual challenges coming to monetary policy from the decline in the natural rate of interest and increased volatility of asset uh, uh, prices or housing prices. And in this discussion, I will just bring a little bit uh, uh, more uh, upfront the analytical background to obtain the conclusion that uh, Klaus uh, uh, very clearly set out in discuss a little more the implication for the central bank strategic review. Uh, the motivating observation of Klaus were very simple. There is a decline in the natural rate of interest in many countries. Uh, you see on the graph on the left, the uh, estimate of the natural rate of interest, uh, uh, according to Alston, Labak and Williams, that we, we put uh, uh, you know, on an interactive version on the website of the New York Fed updated quarterly. And uh, you see that the um, uh, corresponded this natural rate decline, there is a decline in trend growth in most of these countries. Um, in uh, the factors that are behind this uh, decline in trend growth and therefore the decline on the natural rate of interest are uh, many structural factors that have been named um, during mentioned during this uh, uh, Forum already. The second motivating observation uh, is something about the volatility and increase in volatility in housing prices and asset prices. Here I'm reproducing um, this uh, graph that uh, Klaus has presented, the standard deviation of the uh, price to rental ratio. I will mostly focus on housing prices uh, in this discussion. Uh, the pre and post uh, uh, 1990 uh, differ quite a bit. I had some quibbles on how this is computed because uh, post 1990 there was a big trend uh, in housing prices determined partly by the decline in, uh, in the interest rate, uh, but I will defer this. Um, the uh, nice thing is that the country cluster in the upper um, 
left quadrant when you plot uh, the uh, change in the average natural rate across the two period versus the standard deviation. So these are the facts uh, are challenging because of the vicinity of the ELB as uh, uh, Klaus has uh, shown. The many countries have now extremely low or negative uh, short term rates and uh, the inability to use the interest rate for stabilization purposes uh, risks undershooting the target and an anchoring expectation. And the housing price volatility had a major layer to this uh, uh, risk uh, to the to compounds the vicinity of the ELB because increased the natural rate volatility as Klaus has shown. So the analytical framework that brings Klaus to the conclusion uh, of uh, uh, the, the recommendation, the two main uh, takeaways you want of this uh, paper, um, is that um, as an Keynesian model as, as the enough feature to allow to address the, uh, the problem at hand, so has a housing sector, and most importantly, uh, has a departure of uh, uh, expectation from uh, the assumption on uh, rational expectation and housing prices or asset prices evolve uh, in somewhat uh, uh, extrapolative ways. Now, um, Klaus has, uh, and other pe people have uh, used other type of departure from rational expectations. Uh, the essential thing is that this departure may uh, give rise to inefficient fluctuations. Um, the paper accounts the paper, the structure, the framework in which results are derived uh, account for a, a binding ELB constraint. And in, with this model, you can set a well-defined optimal monetary policy problem or maximize the welfare in the presence of a bunch of constraints. This uh, picture is uh, a very uh, important for two reasons. First of all, has the main message um, that is uh, optimal, what uh, Klaus calls optimal inflation target increase due to the, the zero lower balance. Found, uh, is um, uh, different um, in so far as you have different in level in so far as you have subjective expectation versus rational expectation. So in so far as you have some inefficient uh, asset price fluctuation. Uh, but uh, what is uh, uh, important is that uh, uh, the uh, uh, as soon as you um, as soon as you uh, lower the uh, average natural rate, you have a higher probability of hitting the zero bound. So the uh, two main conclusions from, drawn from the, the, the whole talk and the, these pictures uh, revealing is the optimal inflation target, and I put it in quote, is generally higher. Uh, the lower is uh, the R star, uh, the source of price volatility matter, and policy should lean against the asset price. Asset uh, how, or housing prices. Now, this tuition is very simple. I won't repeat it again because it's been uh, um, stressed very well by, by Klaus. However, uh, I wonder if this really means that uh, we need to have a higher inflation target. Does optimal policy calls for a higher inflation target? I would uh, say not really. Um, in, in particular, if we look at how the uh, optimal policy, uh, here I'm saying things that most of you uh, know perfectly well, uh, the optimal policy uh, result in models of that kind uh, is uh, implies a cri optimal criterion, which describes the trade-off in the absence of ELB between uh, inflation and output gap. But when there is a, a ELB, there, is a, some, there are terms uh, involving uh, the constraint and the severity of the constraint represented by this Lagrange multiplier of the constraint. So uh, if you um, think of a gap-adjusted price, level, which I call Q, uh, this uh, constraint, it tells you how much delta Q has different from zero. And the different from zero uh, depends on the severity of the lower bound. So if there is a lower bound, if the lower bound doesn't bind, you go back to the usual trade-off in the absence of zero bound. If it's bind at any time zero, then the QT has to decline to pick up later. Uh, a, the risk of oversimplifying the matter. If you, on the upper um, graph, you I plotted the incidence of the zero bound, so the shadow cost of the zero bound that become at some point z time t zero uh, uh, positive. So you have a constraint here. When the lower bound binds, the gap adjusted price level declines, but then there's a promise of pickup. So optimal policy in this context, simply represented by this two graph, promises high future inflation when current policy is constrained by the zero bound. The decline in the price level will be compensated later, and the extent of the compensation is determined by the extent of the binding constraint. 
Importantly, after this correction, the price level path has moved up, but policy returned to target exactly the same um, target rate that before the constraint. Now, uh, in, with this framework in mind, again, this is purely simplified, um, representation, if you have either a lower R star or you have a larger shock heating on the same level of R star, you have a more stringent constraint, which determine a bigger decline and a bigger uh, catch up later. So what is the result of this optimal policy is that when you compute inflation rate average over the period of undershooting in overshooting results somewhat higher. So. Uh, I would say that the correct interpretation of this um, um, of this uh, uh, optimal policy and of the pictures that we have seen is not that optimal policy calls for a change in the inflation target. And I think, in fact, that Klaus was more careful with words talking about average inflation. But um, it's uh, the implication of conducting optimal policy in this environment, in, the, in this model environment. Um, it implies that the, there is a higher Le average level of inflation because inflation has to average periods of undershooting and success, subsequent corrections. And why making this distinction is important, I think is important because it's problematic to talk about an increase in the inflation target as this is understood, if it is understood by the public as a long-term concept. And the long run target is what the central bank target, except in periods in which uh, has to deviate from the target and will correct later. And I think a commitment to corrective policy with no change in the long run target has the advantage versus increasing the long run target of avoiding the cost of permanently higher inflation. As we saw, um, you know, Klaus said, in fact, you have to balance the cost of higher inflation permanently, the welfare cost with the uh, risk of uh, uh, the cost of non-stabilizing the economy. I think the Fed's framework review process and the new policy strategy underscore perfectly well this difference because the Fed has issued um, the, what we call the consensus statement, that means the statement of longer run goals and monetary policy strategy that was first issued first time in 2012 and has been amended in August 2020. The Fed has uh, restated the existing numerical inflation target at the rate of 2% measured by the um, uh, uh, PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, but opted for a strategy that addresses shortfalls from that target. And so as in order to anchor long-term inflation expectation at the level of the target, will make up for the losses with period of inflation temporarily above uh, the target. And as the Fed Chair, uh, the Fed Chair Powell has uh, indicated in the Jackson Hole speech, this approach could be viewed as a flexible form of average inflation targeting. And I think this is very much in line with the optimal monetary policy uh, in the, that, that, that is behind, be, behind the paper uh, that um, uh, the, Klaus has presented. Now, um, uh, obviously, an important piece is the whole analysis is the role of subjective beliefs. Uh, subjective expectation, as uh, Klaus has shown, may lead to inefficient asset price movement and make the natural rate more volatile uh, than under rational expectation. By the way, one has to consider that all these estimates of the natural rate are extremely uncertain. So there is a you know a lot of uh, uh, um, bounds around this estimate. Um, now, under subjective beliefs, that monetary policy ultimately leans against asset price movement. In this conclusion, uh, that uh, here is reached under uh, in the in the paper that I cite here at uh, the Klaus site, the other paper by Keynes and Winkler. Uh, this conclusion will hold under extrapolative expectation, but hold also under more general form of belief distortion, as uh, Klaus has a uh, another paper with Woodford, and also, also um, when beliefs are extrapolative to invest, even when there is a macro prudential tool available. So, class of models is now exploring also, uh, you know, how much uh, monetary policy has to take uh, on the. Uh, financial stability if there are other tools available. And these important implications call for more empirical analysis, both of uh, the volatility of price and expectation formation. 
to conclude, uh, the paper addresses key challenges, present optimal policy implication. Um, the optimal policy results in period in which we have optimally higher inflation. And this policy rationalizes a particularly aggressive form of average inflation target. Of course, there are open questions, and uh, Klaus already mentioned, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Arja. Uh, I would now uh, give the floor back to Klaus for a reply to the comments by Arja. I would uh, still encourage you to raise your hands and ask questions. You have the floor, Klaus. Yeah, so thank you very much, Achia, for a wonderful discussion. I, um, I agree with all what you have said, and maybe just um, one remark on the semantics of um, average inflation versus the optimal inflation target. So the logic of the exercise is that um, um, the fundamental idea is that the monetary policymaker steers inflation and the economy through changes in real interest rates. Now, at the lower bound, um, this cannot be done anymore through changes in the nominal rates. And um, the way to then stimulate would be to promise conditionally in those situations higher future rates of inflation. And this is, in fact, something that is embedded in the average inflation targeting concept that has now been adopted by the Federal Reserve. But it's also important to note that there's a fundamental asymmetry in that concept as it comes out of the model. You do that at the lower bound when you are constrained, but you do not do that if uh, you want to tighten. So when you want to tighten, you do not have to promise deflation, uh, but you can tighten by just raising the nominal interest rate. So the effect of this asymmetry is to raise the average rate of inflation above what it would otherwise be in the absence of the lower bound. And um, I've uh, thus called um, this average rate of inflation that materializes under this optimal strategy as the inflation target. But of course, it's true that this is not the inflation target uh, at all points in time that you would always target at the medium term. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, we don't have questions at the moment. Maybe I can, uh, can ask uh, a question myself. Uh, Klaus, you... you uh, uh, mentioned in your paper that the, the, fall in, uh, the fall in natural rates justifies an increase in the optimal inflation target. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, this could raise communication challenges as long as inflation remains uh, below aim, which is the situation that uh, we are in uh, in the euro area. You suggest a sequential approach. That is, the central bank should first strive to get to the inflation aim, to bring inflation back in, in line with, with its target, and then announce a, a higher uh, inflation target. But the other uh, um, uh, possibilities have been proposed. One is to enhance the role of fiscal policy. Another, which was uh, proposed by Arja, is to uh, revise the existing numerical inflation target. C can you elaborate on uh, how your result would hold in case one was uh, you know, an analyzing alternative possibilities? Well, this is a very difficult, uh, but also quite interesting question. I mean, the models that we typically wrote, write down do not have, um, typically do not have issues that relate to the reputational concerns of the central bank. So the question is, of course, um, if you increase the target um, and you are not yet going to be uh, reaching for a longer time period, the increased target, will this be costly for the central bank because it's going to affect negatively um, the um, reputation and therefore maybe lead to an unanchoring? And we do not have this in the model. And it's a legitimate concern to entertain. Um, that's why I have proposed that um, a two-step approach where maybe a more regular frequency of strategy reviews allows uh, maybe for a pre-announcement of uh, a regular revisiting of the target. And it may be understood then by the private sector that um, the target may be uh, adjusted in certain directions. And this could have beneficial effects without having the reputational costs. Now, with regard to your question on fiscal policy, um, uh, 
I'm a, uh, I must say I'm a little bit skeptical because the Japanese experience of uh, you know the last years certainly where fiscal and monetary policy have been strongly pushing in the same way is not exactly encouraging. Mm -hmm. And um, this is probably one of the big disappointments um, of this, uh, these experiments. And um, the United States example is perhaps a little more encouraging on, on this front, um, but overall it's not, um, it's not clear that uh, this is a panacea. Thank you. We now have one uh, uh, question by Harald Ulrich from the University of Chicago. Harald, you have the floor. Well, thank you, and thank you, Klaus, for the very interesting uh, talk. I wonder whether the result about monetary policy having to raise, you know, maybe temporarily its inflation target holds more generally. And let me let me get to that with a with a potential critique of this idea that subjective expectations are really at the heart of it all. It's probably, you know, the alternative view to this discrepancy between observed expectations and subsequent market developments is that this is all due to the market discount factor that by appropriately taking into account the, you know, the, the risk weighted probabilities for certain states in the future, there wouldn't be that discrepancy. It's just when you take actual average, uh, you know, realizations that you, that you, that you get this mismatch. So, I mean, it's, it may be hard to truly, you know, um, get from the data whether the subjective expectations are driving this or whether it's just movements in the stochastic discount factor and the expectations are rational. But if I take the fact as given, and, and uh, you know, there was some discussion on this, that indeed as we, as we get to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, lower rates, that uh, the volatility increases, the, 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 the point that you want to maybe then temporarily at least raise inflation target may still seem to be correct. So the question is for the result for monetary policy, do we really need to believe that this is all driven by subjective expectations or is this point more general? Klaus, you want to take up this answer now and maybe Arja, you will also want to comment on Harald's uh, question. Uh, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's see what um, Klaus first says. I'll let Klaus go first. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Harald, for this question. So I'm very happy you asked it because, um, you know, John Cochrane and others have made similar points that say the investor surveys may not be what we take them. Um, they may not report um, expectations, but risk-adjusted expectations. So in response, um, to this, we have actually written a paper which is forthcoming in the Journal of Monetary Economics to, together with Stefan Nagel and uh, Dmitry Matlev, where we actually looked at this point and there's actually no way you can reconcile the expectational patterns that we see in survey expectations with the notion that they arise from risk adjustments. And um, so this is in this sense, pretty bad news. And I think, you know, there's a big discrepancy between the Chicago view, which is always that markets work efficiently and what the general public is doing. If you tell, we write down as surprising models in which people are pessimistic about future returns when the market is valued highly, to the normal investor, this sounds like uh, somewhat unusual. And actually, this is exactly what we see in the survey. So I think it's very puzzling and it's not explained by discount factors. Now, to your second part, I think it is, the point I'm making is more general to the extent that asset price fluctuations, they may themselves be inefficient, but even if they were efficient, they could matter in other ways if there were additional constraints in the economy like borrowing constraints, collateral constraints, maybe default incentives and so on. And then there would be also incentives to lean against those asset price movements in these more richer environments, which we haven't yet studied. Yeah, if I may add something, yes. Fabio. Yes. Um, so I want to cite that um, uh, some research that has been done, some paper published on uh, uh, the survey of consumer expectation that we ran at the Fed, uh, examining the um, behavior of uh, um, 
housing price expectation. Uh, and so what this result, and this is with this experiment control experiment, that's a paper published in uh, 2019 on Ristad um, by Fuster in uh, uh, so far, uh, they uh, conduct in this experiment, they find that indeed uh, expectation of individual expectation, uh, household expectation about uh, uh, pri housing prices uh, do not behave like rational, especially at the medium term frequency. So they tend to, um, they don't tend to revert as the actual uh, price uh, uh, do. And that's uh, in, in line with what uh, Klaus was saying. So they, um, in the very short period that they, have, are directionally, they say directionally rational, but they don't, they under uh, shoot, but on the medium term, they fail to pick up the reversion in uh, in prices. So there is a certainly argument that uh, housing price expectation subjective are quite different from rational. Thank you. We have another question by Helen Ray from the London Business School. Helen, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I would really like to have a view uh, of Klaus on the role of uh, macroprudential policy, which has been mentioned by, by Argia, and in particular, whether um, he is mostly concerned about short-run volatility in asset prices or more low-frequency volatilities uh, leading to uh, uh, asset price bubbles, uh, which are uh, arguably um, maybe taken care of, at least to some extent, by macroprudential tools. So we'd very much want to have his view on, on this. So yes, thank you, Helen, for your question. Um, so indeed, we are not at all concerned about daily volatilities uh, in equity markets or about these sort of short-run fluctuations. It's more about the long-run cycles um, that have also proved to be you know, most damaging to the economy. Um, now, Ideally, if you had a, a second instrument to effectively deal with those, um, um, those cycles, that would be wonderful. I just think that the macroprudential framework in Europe is um, very incomplete and um, it is also not tried and tested. Um, for instance, the incompleteness that is worrying, for instance, is uh, it's mainly geared to banks, but it doesn't address the non-bank financial sector, which is becoming increasingly relevant. Right. And um, the second point is probably then that um, monetary policy, as uh, Jeremy Stein has said, you know, it has the potential to get in all cracks, while the regulations imposed by macroprudential authorities may potentially be circumvented by certain financial innovations that then take place in the financial sector. It's great if it were to work, but I'm somewhat skeptical. Arja, you want to comment on uh, Helen's question. Well, I think it, it would be wonderful to have a more uh, macroprudential um, uh, uh, regulation uh, of uh, tools that that allow to, uh, you know, uh, forestall the fragility in the financial system when there are, uh, uh, you know, looming when there have been excess uh, taking, excess risk taking. But uh, again, uh, I think there should be more discuss on, discussion on that. And I, I, I don't like the idea that uh, uh, the burden has to go on monetary policy alone, but uh, so I would be very much in favor of uh, uh, pushing this measure of macroprudential regulation all over, not just uh, in the Europe, but also in, in the US, of course. Uh Thank you. We don't have any other questions, so uh, I think we can uh, take this uh, session to a close. But uh, uh, before doing so, I would like to emphasize one implication that I draw from the discussion we had. Uh, the low level of our star means that we face a conundrum. Not only has monetary policy less scope for expansion, but it may need to make more use of it, given, as Klaus has shown in his presentation, the high asset price volatility implied by the low rate environment. But central banks have less policy space to address the risk of low inflation than the risk of high inflation. This means, in my view, that they should be less tolerant for inflation drifting downwards away from target. On this note, let me uh, thank once again Klaus, Arja, and all the participants who intervened for this very rich discussion.
I now hand over to Terry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabio and speakers, for such an engaging session. Before a short break, let me take a brief moment to remind all of you of the PhD students in this year's ECB Young Economists competition. They are with us participating in this forum and you will find their research papers and posters on the ECB website. The jury actually, as we speak, is now in session and the best paper will be awarded a prize of 10,000 euro later today at the end of this forum. We will now take a break and I look forward to seeing you all back here at 3.15 sharp. <laughs>